Hi, and welcome to the NoobQuest podcast. I'm your host, Matt Mirafish. Uh, on the show, we talk about game development with an aim for helping people who are new to the process uh, and hopefully shedding some light on the process for people with a little bit more experience as well. Uh, today on the show, I'm very pleased to uh, announce that I have Kelly Santiago, uh, now of Ouya, formerly of that game company, uh, who is involved in the production of such games as Flow, Flower, and Journey, um, all very interesting and important uh, works in the medium of games. Uh, hi, Kelly. Hey. How are you? Good. Uh, is Mirrorfish your real last name? No. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. Totally not real, although it would be really cool. So cool. It yes. <laughs> it's, a, it's a nom de plume. As, as, I like it. It's a good say. one. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, for those people who are not aware of your work in history, uh, maybe you could kind of just give the a, a brief introduction to who you are and what you do. Uh, sure. So I think it's interesting to note. So my background is actually in theater. I went to NYU, got my BFA in theater. Um, I was working in New York for a couple of years, producing mainly producing, managing, doing some performance and performance art, which my husband loves to rag on me for, uh, but I'm a big fan. Um, and just more of those, so I had been a gamer, um, and there had always been a computer in my house, um, and, I, and I sort of say those two things at the same time, because I feel like where it started to converge was when I was working on, um, on these new theater works, a lot of them started incorporating more digital and interactive media elements, and um, I was sort of the the one-eyed woman in the land of the blind in that space and and so since I was comfortable with tech like I become the de facto person in charge of those elements and I thought that I might focus my career on that and that's what brought me to the University of Southern California um, to their fairly new I was in the second incoming class of their MFA and in interactive media program um, and it was there that I, my eyes were really open to um, the world of game design and games as a creative medium and an artistic medium. And I just really before then had never thought about it, never thought who made a game and why. And, you know, that's one of the things I was really interested in when you contacted me about this podcast. You know, I think it's great to um, use all the tools available us, to us now to, like, expose what it means to make games and who's making them really. Um, and, uh, and so that was like my first year and in the same year uh, we went to the Game Developers Conference in San Francisco as a class and, uh, and I got to meet all these game developers um, and it just really felt like sort of the, the creative outlet I'd really been looking for the whole time. Um, I kind of bounced around between various forms of entertainment and just with games, it's such a um, diverse group of people and interests. And in order to make a game, I think it's you need to really be interested in the world and <laughs> in all aspects of it. And it takes engineering and and science, um, but also art and um, anthropology and psychology. And um, and it just uh, I require a lot of stimulation as a person, and it's um, it just provides that and has. I thankfully continued to provide that, even as I um, have spent so much time relatively in games now. Um, uh, so, so I started working on as many student projects as possible, or, or non-student projects, and that's what brought me to working with Genova Chen and a group of other students in our program um, who had been working on this student project called Cloud. Um, and Cloud's goal was to create a game um, that try to express a different emotion than what had been in the mainstream marketplace. And it was really, I mean, it's kind of funny to look back on that time, but it really was for us saying, here's all these things we've learned about games as a creative medium and their pos the possibility to express different emotions. Well, like, can we really do that and make something that people want to play? Like, is this even possible or is really, you can only do that within a, sort of niche artistic group, but um, the commercial audience, mainstream audience, is just like only interested in sort of this other type of content from games. Um, and uh, and we made, so I helped them to finish up the production um, and produce and get go to festivals and 
Um, and when we made it available for download at these fests, just just to make it available for downloads for the people at the festivals to judge it and stuff, um, we ended up getting over 300,000 downloads in a couple months and crashed the school servers a couple times. And, and so that was just really validating. And, and Genova and I just really clipped through that process um, as wanting, and especially in wanting to like continue to try and make games in the commercial marketplace of this nature. Um, and that led us to talking with the folks at Sony Santa Monica who were hadn't even announced yet that PlayStation Network was coming out on the PS3 and they were looking for content kind of of this nature. It was a really great fit. So we ended up getting a three game deal with them um, and that's what led to Flow, Flower, and Journey. Awesome. So that was my way in. <laughs> yeah, terrific. I mean, there's, there's a ton uh, there to talk about. I guess one of the first things uh, that's interesting to me is I feel like you coming through a kind of a master's program and the more academic background, that kind of became a fairly important um, ingredient in the, in the kind of things that you chose to explore and express, um, which is not so, t well, I guess sort of academic games programs are not so common even now, um, but how do, you, how do you feel that that kind of, that was shaped your progress? I mean, obviously it was a, a major component. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the great things about game design programs in academia um, is that you can create in a safe Space where you don't have to you don't have to necessarily think about whether something's going to make money or that your investment in this time you're spending needs to pay off and that gives you freedom to be more experimental to take chances because um, you are safe to fail um, and that environment certainly fed a lot of our attitude towards game development, um, especially at that game company. I think we took it um, maybe to Sony chagrin. Like I think we took it very much into our commercial game making practice, where where we were like, well, as long as we're doing it, um, let's try the the risky thing. Let's try the thing that hasn't been done before, um, and that was always our attitude. Um, and then of course there's huge benefits to being within a larger um, university the way that the interactive media division is at USC because you have access to specialists of all different arenas. Um, I remember talking to, at the time, when a, there was a professor uh, at USC who was the world um, a renowned expert in uh, the 11th dimension, like string theory, and you know, it's like that's a rare opportunity and a rare time in life and um, one of the fun things about grad school especially if you've taken time off is because then you can like really appreciate that that sort of little academic bubble um, that uh, that allows you to have those really high level conversations and that I think if you just went straight into commercial video game development you wouldn't have nearly as much concentrated time of that I think that's a great point, and I mean the the because as you say, you started a little bit later, right? You didn't just go straight from undergrad into grad school, right? Um, <clears throat> which seems like a perhaps an important part of the story. I mean, do you have a feeling about the sort of proliferation of schools that are kind of taking people in as undergrads, saying, "Oh, you know, we're going to teach you everything you need to know to make games," and and sort of the value of that as opposed to either sort of going directly into working or, or self-teaching or... Yeah, I mean, I still think um, there's a certain element of it that depends on how you personally work. Like, I know that I thrive better in a classroom environment when I'm learning a new subject. I just don't... I mean, it's almost like the difference, like, if you're good exercising on your own versus going to a class. Like, I'm a kind of person that I definitely do better when I'm in a class where there are other people and I can look at what they're doing and also, like, feel sort of competitive or, like, challenged by that and asked to step up. And I think also I just enjoy the flow of of grading and I don't know. Just <laughs> I like that. Um, so... 
for me, it was really helpful, but there are certainly a lot of people that have that are self-taught. And, um, and I think there are so many tools and resources today to allow you to do that. And, uh, you know, the other caveat is that a lot of programs um, are expensive. And so that's not something I take lightly when talking to someone about whether it's the right choice for them. Um, but certainly one of the components in choosing a school, I think, is, is you end up definitely learning just as much from the other people in your class um, as the teachers, especially in games programs where you're probably going to be working together quite a bit on projects. Um, and so that's just something if someone's looking at what kind of school they want to go to, I would definitely recommend um, make sure they get an idea of who the other people are that attend that school as well and do they think like they would fit with those type of people and work together with them and, and be challenged by them. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I mean, I think the community aspect is is really invaluable uh, just to be with a group of people who kind of share your motivations all in close physical proximity. I mean, the internet is great, but... Being... Yeah. No, and they're definitely seeing the rise of more, um, like, local, real-life spaces for developers. Like, there's the Vancouver Indie House, um, Glitch City here in L.A., um, I know there are a number of others. I think Austin is starting one as well. Um, where are these sort of co-working, but also places to uh, to check in, you know, and like sort of be a little bit more accountable for the work that you're doing, and so it kind of helps push you. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think that's a very. I'm very interested in that kind of the the rise of those things. I actually. Uh, the first episode of this show, I spoke with Noel Berry, who lives at the uh, Vancouver Indie House. And, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, That's very, very interesting yeah. guy. Uh, <laughs> and it was interesting to, to hear about that for sure. I mean, so one of the things that, I mean, you, you said a lot there in your first kind of intro. One of the things I wanted to unpack a little bit that I thought was really interesting was the that you mentioned kind of you, you had these sort of expressive goals and bring, but we're very explicit about bringing that into kind of commercial projects with a commercial kind of aim, and, and as you said, sort of maybe to the chagrin of Sony. Although I can't imagine they were too chagrined, right? Because all those projects were pretty financially successful. Um, yeah, after the, after they were done, <laughs> <laughs> right. everyone's a lot happier. Then everyone's like, I believed in it from yeah, the beginning. We were, yeah, we were right on board. We had, yeah, we had no doubts at all. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I think that perspective of, because we've seen a lot of discussion about, you know, the term art game has kind of been passed around, and we've seen, you know, as the indie scene has kind of grown bigger, that there's sort of a certain number of people who are doing things that you could say are kind of challenging for the sake of being challenging. I'm thinking of things like Ed McMillan's work, which I, I love very much, but there's a mm. kind of a scatological sort of aggressively gross kind of aspect of that which which I get is a kind of a kind of punk rock gesture in the kind of indie spirit but you guys took quite a different path you know there's a there's a very both mechanically and aesthetically your stuff is very sort of generous and welcoming yeah um, that was definitely a fundamental goal was um, as you say, it's like it's a bit more nuanced than just saying we wanted to make games that that aren't currently available on the video game marketplace. There was this idea that um, video games were, and but maybe still a little bit are, in a place where it was if um, is if movies had only been making action movies for the last hundred years. So if you can imagine that, then you would have people who didn't consider themselves moviers um, that felt like, oh, I don't like movies, and then a discussion of maybe like, are movies bad for you? <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and the truth in all of that is just that uh, someone, it, it's not that someone doesn't like, a, like movies, it's just that there hasn't been a movie uh, that, that they can relate to. Um, and that if we could make uh, games that, that touched on themes that we felt anyone could identify with, that would also invite more people into this medium that we really love uh, of video games um, and showing that it's really not just about one or two things. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. I was just uh, 
playing Flower again in sort of preparation for our interview yesterday, and I, I you know, I was showing it to my five-year-old son and my three-year-old son, you know. Aww. And, yeah, it was it was very, it was really interesting. You know, my three year old kind of grabbed the controller and ran around the chair in circles. You know, so he had he he kind of was very excited by it, but didn't quite get it. But then my five year old really was able to play. You know, uh, and he's getting to the point where he can play games, but you know, many many games he can't play because of the input scheme or because of the complexity or whatever, but this was he really could engage with it in a pretty full way, uh, which was very interesting for me to see. And obviously the aesthetics are very sort of delightful. Um, That's awesome. I definitely remember like one of the first uh, emails that I recall after we released Flow that really touched me was a dad who um, shared Flow PlayStation 3 with his I think two, two year, two or three year old daughter, um, and one evening she came up to him and was just thrilled that she had been able to beat the game. You know, she'd actually been able to finish the whole thing, and they shared that experience, and that was just really special for him. And yeah, that was a big win. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I think it's a, I think it's a very interesting, you know, the goal of of sort of providing broader experiences that can connect with people is something that I definitely relate to. I mean, there's a lot of strange cultural, as you kind of alluded to, a lot of strange cultural feeling about video games, which, you know, I think, as you say, is is largely related to the content. You know, it's not that the kind of idea of interactive art or interactive entertainment is in itself kind of <laughs> damaging or immoral, you know, so... Uh, it's I definitely sort of applaud your efforts in that direction. And then, you know, so one of the, I mean, which is not a question, it's just a big long statement. <laughs> Thank uh, you. <laughs> uh, but so one of the things that you've um, been active in kind of along these lines is the, uh, the Indie Fund. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, maybe you could just talk a little bit about your work with them. Yeah, so actually while I was still at that game company in 2010, um, a number of ind independent developers, we got together uh, to see if there was a way of addressing this huge gap at the time, which has been decreased um, a lot in the last few years, which has been great to see, but um, at the time there was really a large gap between um, the amount of money um, the average independent developer needed to finish their game at a commercial quality and the terms at which, like the things you would have to give up to get that money from the sources that were available because it was really only large investment firms or publishers and the terms were still on the scale of if you needed millions of dollars um, to make your project, uh, which was what the norm was on console especially at the time. Um, so, it, you know, things like giving up um, your intellectual property, the control of your property, um, being able to finish it the way you wanted it to, and it's certainly the revenue share that you would see on the back end, um, which would put developers in these really terrible spots of having to raise money for the project and then barely having any leftover in profit at the end, and then they see a small slice of the revenue that, that players are paying for the game, and so they're just again having to go raise money and you continue and you continue and continue. So if we could pull together money to offer, and the, the largest size fund from Indie Fund is $150,000, but a lot of the projects are like in the twenty to $50,000 range. Mm -hmm. So a relatively small amount of money when it's split between a bunch of people, um, especially very successful developers like 2D Boy, um, Ron Carmel and Kyle Gabler that did World of Goo, and Jonathan Blow that did Braid were involved with, are involved with the fund. Um, and uh, but be able to do it on terms that are still good investment terms, like it's better than putting our money in the stock market or the bank, but but allow for um, much greater uh, financial independence to the developer after the project's over. Um, yeah, and so we've yeah funded Antichamber and Monaco. Um, 
Fract, OSC, those are some of our early we ones. Just, we just did, I just did an interview with uh, with Richard from the Fract team, actually, that was the, the previous Oh, episode. awesome, um, yeah, Richard's awesome. Um, oh, and Dear Esther was another big one. Awesome. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's a, a very interesting and wise approach because, as you say, with the kind of current structure of the, the publishing side of things, it obviously puts a tremendous commercial pressure uh, on the kind of content of what people would want to do, you know, because they say, oh, we're going to take all this money from the publisher and we're going to make sure it's successful. Therefore, we can't just make a game like Dear Esther about walking around, you know, and mm -hmm. nobody's going to want to buy a game like that or, or, you know, so allowing a little more artistic risk. Um, so, I mean, what is it? Is it basically a loan? It is structured as a loan. Um, and the terms, it's indie-fund.com is the website, and the terms are available. Um, we typically do uh, deals where it's we see 100% of the revenue until we recoup that initial investment, and then 25% of the revenue until we've doubled the initial investment, and then we're done. Um, and when, when we started, it was actually also that we scaled it. Um, so it was 1% for every $10,000 we borrowed. Uh, and after two years, we were done. So we wanted to make it very clear, simple. Um, again, something where it is still a for-profit entity, um, but, uh, but that we can do it in a way um, where everybody can win. Yeah, that's okay. great. No, I, I yeah. think that we've seen... It kind of in the in the charitable world, there's been a rise in this kind of practice where mm -hmm. sort of for-profit things that are believed to be for the greater good, um, you know, things like micro loans and stuff like that, which has been a very interesting thing to watch. Mm -hmm. um, and it sounds like you guys are taking a sort of a sim obviously different but but similar approach where you guys are going to make some money, um, but you can kind of do something that's that's uh, beneficial. Um, I think that's great. The, the other thing that I wanted to sort of delve into is something that just in sort of uh, playing flower again yesterday, something that I observed that was interesting is that you, that in, in the design of that game, it sort of couldn't be more mechanically simple. You know, it's mm -hmm. basically about this kind of traversal, you just fly and collide with things and, and keep flying, uh, which is... And, and there's a lot of just there's a lot of kind of joy in that, especially given the kind of super um, responsive environments and the grass is moving and the little particles are flying up and stuff. Um, but it was interesting to me because I feel like a lot of the discussion around sort of interesting games has been in terms of mechanical complexity, and it was it really mm -hmm. struck me to the extent to which you guys have kind of in this case sort of not done that. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it, it was driven a lot by the sort of core goal to make games that were accessible to a wide variety of people, so we wanted to keep the vocabulary of the game very simple. I mean, it was amazing to me, one of, after it came out, and a friend of mine who doesn't play any video games, but being a friend, wanted to check it out, and so, you know, it the, the, there's that at the beginning. There's that like initial little dream sequence, and then it opens up, and it's just that very simple one flower and the green pasture. And so I hand her the controller, and she panicked, like, "Oh my god, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do." And I was just like, "It's okay. <laughs> there's nothing. There's no timer. There's nothing coming after you. Like, just you can figure it out, you know." And um, and in that way, I felt like our games were uh, had this thread through them of inviting people into having an experience rather than punishing them for not doing what we told them to do. And that fed a lot of the design decisions um, for, for all three games. Yeah, no, I think that's really, it was, I, I was showing the game to my brother, who's like a hardcore gamer, last night. And the first thing he said, he came in and he was going really slowly and he said, how do I die? And I said, <laughs> I said, oh, you don't, oh, you don't die. You can go fast. He said, oh, and just started, you know, flying all over the place. It was a very sort of, <laughs> what am I? Like, what's, 
what's going to kill me here? And I was like, oh, nothing's going to kill you. He's like, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> one of my really favorite fun. play testing experiences from that project was this one where, um, so for, for people that don't know, you, um, you press one button to go faster. Um, and if you're not pressing the button, then you'll continue to move, but very slowly, and it's a sort of like slow mode, almost bullet timey kind of experience. Um, and this playtester had gone up. There was this like that first little hill in the first level, and he was just going the whole way at that super slow pace. And so at a certain point, we're you know, in a playtest, you don't ever want to um, tell the player what to do or what they're doing wrong because you want to observe, like, how they're, they naturally are, are playing the game. Um, but we felt like, okay, he's not really going to be useful the rest of the game if he doesn't understand the controls. So, uh, so one of us went up to make sure that he knew what the, the controls were. Um, and he said... Oh yeah, I know. I just really love doing this. <laughs> so <we're> like, okay. <laughs> That's so awesome. Had a really nice afternoon, I guess. <laughs> That's amazing. No, I mean, a lot of people have described the game with adjectives like zen-like and meditative, and and it's it's fun. That wasn't completely my experience of it because it it can be sort of quite fast-paced and. Lively, but it, but it's mm -hmm. that's he's definitely taking the the zen like approach there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's funny. Whenever I boot it up now, I still I still think, yep, man, we made a really weird game. That was awesome. Yeah, <laughs> it's still still pretty different. <laughs> yeah, no, certainly. I mean, I I definitely feel that. Um, and then the uh, the other thing that I wanted to talk about was, you know, in. So you got so you did all all three of those uh, Flow Flower and Journey were all for Sony, uh, mm -hmm. and and you guys had quite a unique sort of experience of doing cloud late in your master's program, and then basically going more or less straight into working with Sony. Was that right? Yep. Yeah, that's right. And and so. You know, I understand there's a kind of a you want to be polite or whatever, but what was the what was the experience like of working with them? And especially, I mean, you know, but, uh, <laughs> I don't I don't want you to say anything mean about anybody, but 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 in well, technically, of, I've I've signed documents that don't right matter, right so okay. made, so. <laughs> of course. So within within that sort of framework, I mean, uh, being quite young and going into working with a, a huge company like that, yeah. um, what was that like? It was tough, man. I mean, it, it's it's tough to work with, I think, any large publisher um, because they have um, they have tons of projects happening, right? And they ha they're moving in their their targets are moving as well. Of like, you know, even thinking about the that time when Flow came out was after the PS3 launch and like. The launch didn't go as well as the Xbox 360 launch, and so then you're respond you're having to respond to that, and so that means probably things internally were changing as far as what their next strategic goals were going to be. Um, and meanwhile, like as a one single developer, like you're just working on your game and you don't understand, like wait, why are you asking for this feature now, or you know what has changed? And so it's certainly one of the points of advice I give a lot is like to to really know that whoever you get money for from, um, they're another person on your team, and so you really have to think about that when you're, you're, you should be interviewing them as well, um, as a partner. And I mean, one of the reasons we signed with Sony is because we had been pitching to a few publishers um, at the time when we were about to graduate school, and just. I mean, literally, after our meeting with Sony, you know, when I hugged each other in the parking lot, because we just, we could feel it. Like, we, they, they got it. Um, as much as maybe on the surface it wouldn't have seemed at the time compared to some other platform manufacturers or publishers, like, they just really did. They got it. And, and that did always continue, I think, to pay off in our relationship because, like I was saying, there, there are struggles. Like, there are also things where you're not used to the milestone deliverable process is like completely different than how you would work on a student project or on your own. And on top of these like milestones you're delivering, 
there are conferences that your game needs to be shown at, which is great for your game, but that means you have to be, especially when you're going to be showing on a PlayStation. Our first one was Tokyo Game Show in the fall of 2006, and like we had to, we were halfway through game production, but we had to make a game that wouldn't break, you know, that wouldn't crash, um, and that showed it really well. And it's like you're not used to kind of finishing the game while you're still in production of it. And that's a whole process. And like how to uh, understanding how that works then with like the schedule that you're planning and all of that stuff. But they were really we had really great advocates there and people, um, you know, we were incubated in their offices. So they, we were also able to, to get a lot out of that in getting very hands-on advice on, you know, how to make a schedule that looks good and like how to, you sort of being able to ask those questions very candidly, I think um, was a very unique relationship with a publisher yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I feel it's funny that, that you mentioned sort of delivering builds for game shows and stuff like that. I was just reading the blog or the site of the guy who does one game a month, uh, mm. and he was kind of advocating. He was like, you should all every every sort of stage of your game, you should have what you call a save point, so you can mm -hmm. have some kind of build that works, you know, so that it's like yeah. you can always like fall back to that if you have to. Yeah, by the time we got to Journey, we got much better at that. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, branching your code, like figuring out how to do that uh, with whatever um, tool you're using for code sharing is really can be really helpful. And then also uh, bug fixing as you go along um, because there is this element where certainly by the end of your project, there's so many systems interacting with each other, it can be really, really hard to debug at that point. Um, but then also, it gives you an idea of the real time that your beta to final period, which is when you're debugging, like it'll give you a better idea of what, how long that's gonna be. Um, if you're always checking in and like making these sort of more polished builds as you go along. Yeah, that, I think that's really great advice because I mean, having, it's something I just only recently started to learn about. It's like using source control and using like things like mm -hmm. GitHub and stuff and just like pushing stuff to a repository. And it's definitely saved me some horrible situations where I'm like going back, looking through backups and time machine, trying to find old files that aren't ruined, you know. So it's a, yeah. good, tip. It's a good tip for anybody starting out, even if you're working by yourself. Uh, yeah, no, and it's good. And it's like can be super frustrating because you're like you have that idea for the next design implement, like the next thing you want to implement in the design, and you like you want to do that next prototype, and it's really hard to be disciplined enough to just be like, no, I need to stop, and like this week I'm just gonna focus on refining my builds, and yeah, but it pays off. Yeah, no, I think that's that's definitely uh, really really kind of practical uh, advice for people. So maybe kind of on that note, uh, if you were talking to young Mirror World Kelly Santiago, who's 18 years yeah. old, uh, and Kelly says, hey, I'm thinking about, you know, maybe, I don't know, getting involved with games, uh, what, would you, what would you say? Yeah, I, well, I always think about, because um, NYU had one of those uh, program. I mean, they still do, um, have a program for individualized study, you know, where you can, like, take whatever courses that you want. And I remember talking about it with a high school guidance counselor who was like, oh, don't do that because those degrees don't mean anything oh. and, like, you know, people don't know what you're doing. And I regret that so much because... The truth is, unless you're in already know like your trade profession, like a like lawyer or yeah. um, a doctor, like what you actually get your undergraduate degree in does not matter. It like, no, doesn't matter at all. And I think those programs um, for people who are interested in multidisciplinary fields like games and technology, that's really like such a perfect um, match because then you can take all of the classes that you want from all the different programs. And so I wish I had done that. That's what I would have said. No one cares, Kelly. <laughs> Just take the classes that you want. <laughs> Such good advice. I totally agree with that. I mean, I 
had the I, I actually also went to NYU for undergrad and had the jumped around to a bunch of different stuff, but ended up with an East Asian studies major, uh, <laughs> which is completely irrelevant to everything I have done and am <laughs> living with, and you know, it just could not be more irrelevant and didn't matter at all. Uh, <laughs> and you know, so anybody telling you just basically don't listen to your guidance counselor. Um, yeah, and uh, the other thing I would have said, my husband and I talked about this too, because we feel like we both made this mistake separate of one another of um, don't go home over the summer. Like, get mm. internships, like, get an apprenticeship, or, you know, just find something interesting in the city you're in. I mean, for me, I was like, I was in New York. Like, I just wish I had done anything there each summer instead of going back home. So, or yeah. go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's that's really good advice. I mean, that was something that was doing internships. I started interning when I was really young because I went to like a weird alternative high school. Uh, it was oh, cool. super valuable. And that's actually where I learned the things that I made my money with for my, you know, for 15 <laughs> awesome. years. I learned to do video editing and then I just did video editing. I worked all through college, <laughs> video editing, and it was great, you know. And where where was that? Great. In New York. I grew up in New York. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, the school was called City As School. If anybody's listening in New York, you should, <laughs> you should send your kids there because it was. I didn't have to go to school. <laughs> I just went and worked four days a week. It was amazing. I learned all nice. the cool stuff. Yeah, it was really great. Um, I, was a, I was a proofreader at a literary agency. I was the one going through the slush pile. I was like 16. Uh, That's that awesome. Was, that was sobering, though, because at the time I thought I wanted to be a writer, and I'm like, oh, wow. Some right, sixteen-year-old intern is going to be looking at my unsolicited manuscript. <laughs> Pretty crazy. Um, but anyway, uh, the the other thing I want—I made some notes of questions that I want to make sure I don't forget. Um, the oh, something. This is just totally sideways, but I, I thought it was, it's a remark I've heard you make that I thought was really interesting, and is is. A cool subject, you know, something that you talked about was in making cloud uh, when you took it to, I can't remember, some show, uh, maybe the IGF student uh, thing, and that it stood out because it was blue. Oh, yeah. Uh, which I That's love I, that. I was just mentioning that again recently because I, I, when, when I was at E3 um, with the, Uya had sponsored Indicate, and so we had a booth of three or four stations there. Um, and it's still true today, like not for, we didn't have, we weren't showing cloud or anything, but, um, but that ability for a unique looking game to just attract someone from all across the floor, <laughs> like moths to a flame. Um, and yeah, I think, uh, I always get frustrated when I see independent games that have the, a sort of space marine palette of black, blue, and purple. Because it is, it just looks like everything else. Or similarly, um, uh, anything in sort of the turn-based strategy or digital card games where it's like the dark fantasy style. Um, it's just so it make it just you're it puts you on an uphill battle at that point. Yeah. Like um, for you know whether it's fair or not, I don't know, but it's it just like if you can find a unique visual style for your game, and I think we are in a space where it's still not hard to do that in games, um, then um, then it just sets you up for for sort of an easier path in in marketing games. But yeah, it was like with cloud it was just most of the screen was this light blue as the boy was flying through the sky or looking at the ocean. Um, and it definitely stood out in the, in, on the IGF floor. And I think we got a lot of players there as a result of that. Yeah, I mean, I think that's just awesome, awesome advice. It's definitely something I've observed. And it's something especially in the kind of, you know, I mean, I'm... I, I think that one of the things that has been a kind of an issue uh, in games in terms of keeping them boring in certain areas is the kind of overemphasis on kind of visual fidelity and reflections and all that, like high frame rate HD graphics. But it, the, the, if something has a distinctive visual style, uh, mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be super complex or polished, just that 
I find myself instantly wanting to know more about it. Like you see things on Twitter, people, you know, all these like little tiny screenshots scrolling by, and you're like, oh, what's that? <laughs> why? That's that's orange. Like, what is that? It's not, mm-hmm. brown. It's not brown or like dark gray, you know. Um, and so I guess to to turn that statement into a question, I mean, do you have any other thoughts about uh, how people those kind of relatively cheap aesthetic differentiators that people can make um, outside of kind of, you know, color palette. Is that, what are the other things? Yeah, meaning like what are things that people can do to, or just, you know, the ways to think about kind of doing something original or unique or, or differentiating yourself from sort of everything else that you see. Yeah, well, I mean, I think um, being realistic with what you can accomplish and still stand out commercially. Like, I feel Sony was really great at this um, in pushing us towards this, and and Genova was as well. Like, I feel like Genova has always, with his work, um, felt like there was no reason he couldn't make something that looked, like, as good as anything else that's out there, despite you know how what his resources were, it was just a matter of optimizing the resources that we had. So I feel like one of the clear examples of this um, was on Journey. One of the original character designs was a more articulated, like we called him Ninja Dude in a in a long outfit, um, sort of Bedouin outfit um, with arms and legs, though, and the legs. Uh, require would have required like so much animation work, um, and with the arms, there was an expectation when people were playing that as that person to be able to like push and pull and climb up things, um, which we weren't going to be able to implement in the game because of the time we had and the team we had. And so we cut off the arms, so it's like the robe covers the arms. There's no arms. Um, you only see these little abstract feet. And uh, and most of the animation is done through the um, through the wind in the robe. Um, there were still quite a number of animations between like walking, running, and s- surfing and all that stuff. But um, but we reduced it a lot, and it allowed us to create something that looked as polished as anything else on the PlayStation, um, even though we only had a team of thirteen people at our biggest on that project. And so. That's also something I think is important to keep in mind, especially if you're like a team of one, is like what are the things that you can do and to try and pick a style for your game but also the features for your game that will allow that to happen. Okay, I, always, I, guess, I always get annoyed when I see uh, maybe like a cool... Through, you, you know, you can see like the standard like Unity environments and in some of the indie games. You know, it's like looking interesting, and then they have a waterfall. But it's like there's no game reason to have this waterfall. You don't interact with it. It's just like meant to be the environment. But I think we've all seen it. But it's like it looks terrible. Like the water <laughs> looks awful. It looks so fake, and it's just like it takes you out of the moment. And there's and there is no reason for it. And so that's another instance where I just be like cut that and like focus on the elements that you need for your environment in order to make the gameplay interesting. Yeah, I know. I, I well so cut off the arms. That's the uh, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's the advice there. No more arms. <laughs> Characters without arms for 2014 are in no arms in the new black and yeah. No, but I think that's that's a really, really useful piece of advice. Uh, and that's definitely something that, as you say, you see people kind of making these self-inflicted wounds where it's like, mm-hmm. didn't need to put that in, and it looks really bad, and, and you know, yeah. So I think that's uh, that's awesome. And then um, something that you mentioned, uh, and it's a, 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 something else that I wanted to talk about, is that your, your new role uh, working with Ouya, um, mm-hmm. where you're sort of managing uh, developer relations for them. Um, how's that? How's that going? And and what is that like? It is going well, and it's really fun. There's an awesome. So Uya is still just like 30 people for the whole console, which I think is always amazing. Um, and so as you can imagine, it's a really passionate group of people, um, really passionate about just how do we 
create a better games marketplace that can allow more voices to be heard. Um, and that's what I was interested in when I signed up with them. Um, and so I work with them to, uh, we do do some game funding, um, so looking for content that would be a great fit for the platform, um, but then also uh, helping the development team um, build out tools and resources uh, to better support developers, because I think what OUYA is um, the only platform where you can, in the living room, where you can have an idea today and you could prototype it tonight and you could publish that on the console tomorrow and be a living room console developer. Um, and I just think that's really powerful, especially as we're seeing more people wanting to take their game playing hobby into a game making hobby. Um, and and you know, exactly what we're doing here, right, is like opening up um, that space to anyone interested in making a game um, and what does that mean and like how can we connect players with that kind of content um, I think it's really awesome yeah and it's so exciting yeah, to see like what people are doing with it even though it's small in numbers like there's just so much passion there um, which I think speaks to that really inter the, that interest that's awesome I mean maybe uh, you could sort of give a little more detail on that process. So let's say I let's say I'm working in a tool like Unity and I've created a, you know a little project that I've finished uh, and I would like to publish to the Ouya platform. What are the kind of steps involved in that? Well so you go to ouya.tv and there's a develop um, button. Uh, you have to get the the ODK um, for Ouya which is Android based. Um, so Unity is one of one of the supported platforms and it's really well supported. We ha we use GitHub for open source documentation as well. Um, so right now, I, it's like if you were to do it today, it's a little bit convoluted. It's like more for an intermediate developer, I think, or just someone who's like willing to sit down and go through documentation, but that's something we're working on right now. In the next couple weeks, we'll be updating that developer portal to have sort of much simpler throughput and um, and also creating video documentation on the console that people can reference on how to get their game there too. Awesome, very cool. Yeah, no, I think it's a. I remember when the uh, the Kickstarter started, and I was very very interested to see the kind of mission. I love the I love the goal mm -hmm. of kind of democratizing uh, living room gaming. Uh, I think it's, it's super interesting. So what, uh, what is coming for the platform uh, gaming-wise? I know Towerfall has been a, a popular title over there, and there was some talk about um, That Dragon Cancer. Mm -hmm. um, which, yeah. has, that, has that released, or is that still in development? It's still in development. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited about that project. Um, also, one of the games that we showed at E3 as well, uh, this game, um, upcoming game called Thralled, um, which is about playing as a um, Congolese uh, woman with a baby, um, and you're trying to escape uh, the slave traders, essentially, through the, through the game. Um, so really different, um, really uses, I think, that aspect of games to elicit empathy um, yeah. in an interesting way. Um, and then on the other side of the spectrum, we have uh, actually tomorrow the release of So Many Me, which is this really adorable uh, platformer um, where you encounter clones of yourself. And so then you kind of have to collaborate with the other yous in order to traverse the environment. And um, the personality is just really awesome. And it's also a good example of uh, an art style that, that I think is, is that stands out. Um, it's really beautiful. Um, and, uh, and another awesome local multiplayer game um, called Toto Temple Deluxe is coming out mm -hmm. soon, which we've shown at a couple conferences now but, um, and on our Twitch stream. Um, but yeah, madcap. Fun. Um, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll, look, I'll look forward to checking yeah. this out. I mean, uh, maybe the last thing that we could just talk about briefly as we wrap up. Uh, the you mentioned the term. You know, you mentioned empathy, and there's been a kind of a discussion about sort of empathy games as a genre, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is kind of an interesting term. And I know, um, you know, especially with your kind of uh, bringing that dragon cancer. 
uh, which I think we could safely describe in that category to Ouya. Um, what's your feeling about that as kind of a label and as a kind of a concept, the sort of empathy games idea? I, I like that. I think it does um, describe the heart of those experiences really well um, as far as what, I mean, it's almost like instead of leveling up to be a boss, you know, leveling your skills, what you level up in the game is your understanding of the experience. And, and in a lot of ways, Journey was in that same space, mm. right? That's what it's actually one of the goals of the game was to like create empathy for other people. Um, and games, I think more than any other medium, are really well set up to to elicit to elicit empathy. Um, one of my uh, not for what an ex game experience that it's always stood out for me was um, actually in, in Red Dead Redemption. You know, I think there are a lot of Western films and literature in that genre, um, but I never really, it was never really for me, but playing as that character in Red Dead Redemption, uh, there's a moment where you wrap up the missions in Mexico, and you know the next step is to go like, get your wife and kid. Um, and I knew that I had to do that, but at the same time, I was enjoying like being out in the wet, the wild west, and that experience. And and really, I felt that that sense of being torn. And I and then I thought, you know, that's exactly that is an emotion that so much of those films and the literature like try to capture. But I never got it until I really empathized with that main character by taking those actions. Possibly yeah. at more mass murder scale, but... <laughs> <you know>. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> well, it's, a, it's an incremental process, right? Exactly. Um, the, no, I mean, I think that's a great... The, the, one of the things that I think the games as, a, as an art form have to offer that's very interesting is this feeling of embodiment, you know, where mm -hmm. you're not watching two people have an interaction, it's sort of you're representing yourself as doing this action. I mean, I definitely feel that, in, especially in some of these kind of, you know, like GTA type games or whatever, which are obviously very, like, accomplished works, but you're like, oh, do I really want to, like, be doing all these horrible things. Like it's it's one of the reasons I haven't kind of completely enjoyed those games as much is because I just don't really want to embody someone kind of running over people, you know? Right. Um, yeah, like someone was pointing out to me that in a there's no option in Grand Theft Auto to not have like an aggressive inter a physical interaction with someone. Like when you're running along, like you can't you can't like tap them or hug them. Like, or, like it has to them. be like boom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Exactly. No, it's it's well. It's, I think I think slowly but surely we're we're gaining different different modes of personal mm -hmm. expression in the digital space. Um, and I think that, that the work that you and your compatriots have done has, has played a, a big role in that, so thank you very much. Um, thank you. And so for those people who would like to connect with you online, find out more about your work at Ouya, uh, where should they go? Uh, well, my Twitter is Kelly San, K E L L E E S A N, um, and then my website, which is horribly dated, and I apologize for the way it looks, uh, is kellysantiago.com. Um, it has my email on there, and you can totally reach out. Awesome. Well, thank you so so much for coming on the show. I really enjoyed talking, um, and uh, best of luck with everything. Thanks so much. Cool. Okay. Bye. Bye.